Father Tyson approached Karen with his crucifix. She jumped up and roughly shoved Rogers aside. She kicked Sister Ruth in the face and glared at the priest. Her eyes bulged out of their sockets. The whites were enlarged. It looked as if someone had glued two golf balls where the eyes should have been. She was grotesque and brimming with undiluted hatred for the Catholic priest. Karen's gaze caught the eyes of the six foot two inch Father Tyson. A loud thump resounded throughout the room. Karen had not raised a hand, yet Father Tyson was violently knocked down. He began to moan and roll around on the carpet. Both hands clasped his abdomen. It was just as if someone had drawn back a huge bald fist and punched the priest right in his stomach. The crucifix flew from his hands. It now lay on the floor approximately 10 feet from where he had been standing. Karen's wide and wide eyes fell on the crucifix. We could actually see sparks emit from their hideous looking eyes. Electrical energy appeared to be flowing out of her. The crucifix moved on its own. It bounced along the floor for a moment. It then began to bend and twist as if it were made of soft rubber. The figure of Christ broke free. The hands, no longer nailed to the cross, tightly clasped the figure's head. It looked as if Christ was in more agony at this point than he was while he had been so cruelly nailed to the crucifix. Both the cross and the figure of Jesus then suddenly disintegrated. We all stared fearfully in amazement. Hi, and welcome to our show, Tales of Glory. I am your host, Michael Norton of M16 Ministries. I am also the author of A Field Guide to Spiritual Warfare and Advanced Field Guide to Spiritual Warfare. If you're curious about who I am, who is this guy? And where does he get this weird stuff? And I've never heard of him. You probably haven't ever heard of me. That's okay. I'm a street minister that's heavily involved in spiritual warfare. And now I moved on to the counseling side of people who are survivors of the occult. A lot of my ministry is heavily documented in m16ministries.blogspot.com. And a lot of really cool stuff is documented over a field guide to spiritual warfare.blogspot.com. Anyhow, take a look at those. Tonight we cover episode three of our show. Yeah, we made it to show number three. This is part three. We're covering the book, The Devil and Karen Kingston by Robert W. Pelton. And tonight we're getting down to the nitty gritty of what the... Um, the root spirits are, and we'll see if they get evicted. It's been an interesting journey so far, and I welcome you back. If this is the first time you're listening, feel free to go back and listen to our other two podcasts. So check out the first two if you're new to the show. If not, sit back, pull up a chair to the fireside here, and let's discuss what's going on here with this exorcism of little Karen Kingston. So far, we've yet to get the root spirits. In our previous episodes, we were talking about how many times deliverance ministers say these things are like onions, right? They're they're layered and you have to know which spirit's tied to what. You can't go into a spiritual battle like this with this assumption. The only thing you have at your side is the Holy Spirit, conviction of the Holy Spirit, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, Jesus giving you verses, and most important, your authority. You must know where you stand in your authority. A lot of churches speak about authority, they teach authority, but it, when it comes down to it, like when people contact me in hauntings or something's going on, even minuscule stuff like, help, I think my finances are, you know, are cursed. And hey, when we're in a recession or something, everybody's finances are cursed, but people don't stop to think about that. They immediately blame demons. So the first thing you need to do is learn our spiritual authority. Where are we walking into this? What are we allowing into this? So as we get into this, we're going to return um, back to Reverend Rogers, right? He is our man. He's been demonstrating a lot of cool things about spiritual authority. Again, there's a few things from my past experience. I've done, you know, tons of these these ministries with um, demonic stuff involved, whether it's hauntings or whether it's people being delivered or, and the, the tougher cases where they were full on exorcisms. The church itself really doesn't understand what a possession is. They're rare. Um, when we do come across them, they're, they're, they're very difficult and they take long-term intercession it's mark 929 ministries which i do a lot of here anyhow so we get back to reverend rogers and uh the scooby gang right we have father tyson we have sister ruth it's a uh, sister ruth rogers is reverend rogers wife and we have <laughs> unfortunately the portly pastor sutter oh my gosh you know if this is true he went down history as a portly um, pastor sutter feel sorry for the man anyhow he's awesome so let's dive back into our story 
Okay, we're on chapter 16. King of the House, the 11th Demon, and Mervyn, the 12th Demon. So we're here. We're, now we're on day three, Monday, April 15th, 1974, 9.15 a.m. The formidable Richard Rogers discerned that there are still more demons in control of retarded Karen Kingston. According to Jean, the ninth entity, there were three more yet to be expelled. This was further verified by Envy, the tenth evil spirit who had been written down the names of all the rest. Rogers over the last two days had become more convinced that the little Karen's retardation was undoubtedly caused by her demonic possession. So much had already transpired to help verify his belief. He felt certain that the most powerful demon of demons were still maintaining a tenacious hold on the frail girl. Richard didn't waste time in getting started. He ordered satanic forces to come forth and to speak to him. An almost syrupy, sweet, friendly male voice responded. Hello, pal. How's it going today? Who is this speaking? asked Rogers. It's me, king of the house. The evil entity sounded nonchalant. It was as if there he were settling down for a long, unpressured conversation. Rogers immediately came back at the demon. Are you alone, this girl? Are there others in her with you? I'm never alone. Tell me who is in there with you, demon. None of your business, you old scabby goat. King of the house never raised his voice. He still sounded unafraid, unperturbed. I command you to tell us, interjected Sutter the Baptist. By the blood of Jesus Christ, you must answer our question. Who the heck are you? responded King of the House with a chuckle. He still seemed unconcerned. Just who in the heck do you think you are? Do you want another belt in the snot locker? Mind your manners, boy. You know this man, replied Rogers, and you surely know who I am. We are two of God's children. I am filled with the Holy Ghost. I am close to Jesus. You must answer. Who is in there with you, demon? Oh, what the heck? A dull moronic nothing who calls herself Prudence, and an inane witless creep who goes by the handle of Mervyn. The voice became slightly resigned. Karen gave a sigh. Who are they? She's a witless sickness wench, and he's a slobbering idiot. Neither one of them has a lick of sense, responded King of the House. He then perked up. I can't stand either of them. They're all dull and lacking imagination. I thought you demons were all supposed to stick together, questioned Sutter. And I thought I told you to mind your own business, retorted King of the House. Well, King of the House, aren't you all supposed to stick together? asked Rogers. We do, said the same friendly voice. King of the House sounded surprised that Reverend Rogers might even thought otherwise. But that doesn't mean we have to like each other, does it? Well, does it? I want to talk to the other two, responded Rogers. King of the House cautiously explained. Mervyn doesn't look very talkative. In fact, he seems to be sort of pouty. Prudence says she feels bad. She doesn't exactly have much desire to yak with this with you right now. Rogers then began to converse directly with the two incommunicative demons. He told them both that he was aware of their presence. He then commanded either one of them, both of them, to speak. Immediately, resistance could be felt throughout the room. It began to feel cold and damp. Are you dumb spirits? Is the king of the house right about you? Are you ignorant, uninteresting spirits? Rogers proceeded to mock the diabolical entities. Remember? Uh, Jude 8 through 10, we don't do this. I'm interjecting here. Don't mock them. Karen sat in brooding silence. In Jesus' name, I command you to speak. There was a continued hush in the room. Rogers was ignored by the demons. Then, laughing, Rogers leaned over and whispered in Karen's ear, You must be ignorant demons. We certainly know this now. You aren't able to hold an intelligent discussion. You can't talk. Dumb, 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 dumb. You can't speak, but Jesus could. Jesus was much smarter than the both of you combined. What are your names, O oh evil ones, inside this beautiful child? What are your names? Asked the Baptist Sutter. We want to get to know all you better. Tell us your names and tell us, tell us what we want to know about you. One demon answered. He was effeminate and dripped with sarcasm. It had to be prudence. What is your name, O oh great fat man, posing as a preacher? What is your name, O oh fat man with enormous belly? Boy, are you ever a gigantic blob, or should I say slob? You're disgusting. By the blood of Jesus Christ, charged Rogers, reveal yourself this moment. By the sacred blood of Jesus, answer me. 
Karen's countenance changed to one of sternness. Her eyes sparkled waves of anger. Satanic entities remained silent. Roger spoke up strongly against the demons. He yelled, In Jesus' name I command you all to speak. I will keep repeating the name of Jesus until you do. My name is Legion, for we are many. My name is Legion, for we are many. My name is Legion, for we are... Karen threw back her head and howled with delight. Sutter paled and stepped back. Father Tyson clasped his hands together and began to pray in Latin. He too appeared to be afraid. Rogers quickly interrupted the demon. He knew the satanic spirit was trying to make a fool of him by quoting Mark 5, 9. Richard came back at the evil entity. If you are legion, and you are many, then I shall do exactly as Jesus did in Mark 5, 13 and Luke 8, 38. And force you all to leave this child, whether you are one or whether you are many. I remind you, demon, that Jesus did this when he sent the legion out of the devils out of the gathering. But you are not that man you mentioned, replied the masculine voice. This one was more powerful on guard. Prudence had withdrawn. You do not have his power, nor do you have the right to act as he did. Okay, this is something typical demons challenge you with, right? Challenging his authority now. Like, who do you think you are? He goes, we're of the family of Jesus. So this, this demon's testing him to see if uh, Rogers knows his authority. It's standard demonic tactics. So here we go. You know this, and I know this. But just to soothe your savage, hateful nature, I have decided to tell you whatever it is you desire to know. What was it you wanted from me? What is your question? I am Mervyn. I speak for prudence and myself. We want to, to leave our friend, king of the house, alone. Stop this silly game. Stop the silly game. Stop talking to us. Stop bothering us. Go away. We don't like you. See, so we, we found, may have found the root demon here. They're, they're blocking and they're not letting the, the ministry team talk to that demon, which they shouldn't be anyway. They should be binding that demon and binding these little demons to that demon to cast it out. So in other words, I bind um, Mervyn and Prudence to King of the House. And I command King of the House to leave. Shut up and leave. In Jesus' name, never return. Right? That's what we're looking at here. But these guys aren't doing it. The same demon identifying himself as Mervyn was now responding in a low, sullen voice. It was as if he was trying to warn Rogers of some dire consequence in store. Then write something for me, replied Rogers, and I'll not bother you for a while. There was complete silence on Mervyn's part. Nor did Prudence or King of the House respond. I command you, Mervyn, to write for me, said Rogers. I do this by the authority given me by Jesus Christ, save their world. Mervyn growled back at Rogers. King of the House is illiterate. He's so slow-witted that he can't write or even draw pictures. See, they're lying for him now. They don't want... If, if the king of the house comes forward, they can bind him. They should have done it anyway. They know he's there. They got his name. Anyway, he's kind of backward, but I'm not that kind of idiot. King of the house may be, but I'm not. I'm certainly not this lowly caliber. Karen took up one of the pencils. Mervyn, using his power over the child, began to carefully draw out his letters. Mervyn spelled simple words as he slowly formed each alphabet character. He finished and Karen put the pencil down. The still friendly voice of the king of the house again came front. Mervyn doesn't wish to speak with you anymore. You insulted his intelligence. He's hurt over this and he's sorely perplexed with you. I'd advise you to leave him alone. Rogers disregarded the warning. Where are you from, king of the house? I can't reveal that to you, he replied. I'm not ever allowed to say where I'm from. Besides, you already know where I'm from. Please don't push this line of questioning. I must warn you, do not ask such things of us. Where? Pressed Rogers. Where? I cannot expand on this. I'm not allowed. It's against the rules. King of the house tone was somewhat weary. He was more fearful now and quite defensive. In the name of Jesus, you are required to answer me truthfully. You must. You're beginning to play unfairly. I'm beginning to despise this house interjected Mervyn, suddenly joining King of the House in a more argumentative tone. I'd wish i never come here. It's starting to bug me. Well then, where are you from, Mervyn? queried Rogers. At this point, Karen became wide-eyed and began to whimper. She tried to slide off her chair, but Rogers, Sister Ruth, and Sutter held her down. Where, Mervyn? Tell me, where do you come from? Mervyn moaned as if he was suffering from the same kind of terrible anguish. I'm not allowed to tell you. I cannot say. I have to answer for many actions too, you know. Satan forbids you to answer? There was no further response. Does Beelzebub forbid you to reveal this information? Yes! Yes, wailed Mervyn, now thoroughly shaken. His tone was one of resignation and despair. I can say no more, but I can tell you what I am about a specialist. A specialist, responded Father Tyson. 
He'd be standing about 20 feet away intently listening. The conversation had pricked his curiosity. He felt drawn back in the exorcism. The man in the black moved closer. Oh, shut up, replied Mervyn. He was brusque. Karen's head swiveled to the left and her eyes caught fell on the Catholic priest. Who the hell do you think you are, such audacity? You're a rude son of a bitch. I'm not talking to you, so keep your mouth shut and let us carry on an intelligent conversation. I warn you, Tyson, button your lip. Father Tyson hushed. He looked hopelessly over at Rogers. Mervyn chortled, don't look at him. He can't do anything to get you off the hook. Just keep your damn big nose out of this discussion. It doesn't concern the likes of you. Then to Rogers, as I was saying before we so rudely interrupted, I'm a specialist. I was handpicked by our leader for this particular job. And I will say, I think I'm a pretty good in my specialty. So you're a specialist? A specialist in what area? Asked Rogers. Exactly what kind of demon are you? Gosh, I thought you'd never ask, joked Mervyn. Everyone here knows me as the powerful one. I boss them all around. I even take all our jobs over when I feel I need to do some diversions. It can be great fun. It's especially nice since I can do anything at any given time. Okay, so here, we're dealing with a spirit of distraction. I still think um, King of the House is the, the root spirit here that we need to go after. And so Mervyn pops up, and now he's distracted. He's spirit of distraction, right? He's going to run interference. He can do whatever he wants when he wants. He's trying to protect the root spirit in there. I have total authority over your leader, emphasized Rogers. Jesus is the reason I have such authority. Satan, or whoever it is you call him, is my slave, just as he was a slave of Jesus Christ. I have authority over your master, just as I have authority over you, demon. Therefore, I command you and king of the house both to leave this child's body. There was complete silence. Another chill passed through the room. Karen appeared to be dumbfounded. She blinked as she had difficulty seeing. Rogers continued, I command you in the name of Jesus on his blood to release this young girl from her bondage. Depart from her. Karen gasped. Mervyn weakly replied, I am so damn worn out. Let me rest for a minute, then I'll be glad to go away. Just allow me a moment's rest. He tried to withdraw. Rogers would have none of that. See, the spirit of distraction is trying to slither out of here. That's what he's trying to do. So keep an eye on this. He strongly sensed that victory was dose at hand. I'm beginning to get a horrible headache. Please wait for a few minutes. My headache is about to split. Karen clasped her head with both hands and sobbed. This time it was King of the House who was trying to swerve Rogers off course. His voice tone had changed. It was candid. Please call the good Dr. Pershing over here. Let him help me. I really need to discuss my illness with him. See, he's running a distraction. Another one. That's all it is. This distraction's here. Just to slop down the, stop the exorcism. Stop the expulsion of demons. If you want won't quit harassing us, then at least you could do would be allow me to speak privately with a good doctor. <laughs> Dr. Pershing, even after all he had seen over the past two days, was still taken by surprise at the request made by King of the House. But he didn't lose his composure, nor did the man of medicine make any effort to come any closer to Karen. He had witnessed too much, both in the spiritual realm as with the physical. He was mulling over the situation. Dr. Pershing thought, I've personally witnessed numerous and astonishing physical manifestations of this demon if that is what they actually are in his child. So have all the other professionals in this room? Yet can it be real? Nothing at all like this has covered my medical text. Imagine what it would be sound like if I were to print this case in an AMA session. Why, they'd laugh me right out of business. But then it's true. I've seen these physical changes. And yes, I did examine Karen before, during and after the various exorcisms. Yet I still can't bring myself to admit that physiologically reality of our clear reversals in this child's condition. No, it can't logically be. But here it is in front of me, staring me right in the face. God, oh God, help me to understand. Meanwhile, Rogers was continuing his verbal attack on the demons. He ignored Karen's heart-trending sobs, right? It's distraction. He ignored the pleas of the king of the house. You both know that you must go. I'm ordering you out, said Rogers. Richard appeared to be gaining new spiritual strength as demonic entities noticeably grew weaker. He proceeded with the battle. In Jesus' name, come out, Mervyn, and come out, King of the House. Both of you, come out in the name of Jesus. Okay, okay, I'm coming, I'm coming. I don't like it in here anyway, rasped Mervyn. King of the House didn't reply. You've really screwed everything up in here with the damned religious bigotry you keep spouting off. I am leaving peacefully. And with these words, Kevin's mouth flew open. 
Her chest went in a slight pumping motion. Her Adam's apple bobbed momentarily. She began to gag. Her hands clutched for her throat as she shook and shivered. Rogers again commanded Mervyn to release her. The demon had broken his promise to go quietly. He tore her from Karen with all a shrill, ear-shattering scream. There was one last great convulsion. He picked Karen right up out of her chair. She was tossed limply across the room. Rogers, Sister Ruth, Sutter, and Tyson jumped to her aid. They all helped the forlorn little girl to her feet. She stood there limp, shaken, and bewildered. He thought that Mervyn had departed, but Reverend Rogers knew better. Well, you've won this time, preacher boy, sneered Mervyn. He sounded disgusted at the outcome and resigned to his ultimate fate. Karen's face was expressionless. We'll meet again sooner or later. I'll get in with you for this. You almost got everybody out of here now. All that bossy garbage you've been throwing at us. I won't stand another minute of it. I don't have to. Don't worry, I'll go. I'll go. There are plenty of other places better than this one. Karen belched loudly three times and began to cough as she sank back to the floor. Green slime filled her mouth. She gagged. Sister Ruth held a large towel to Karen's lips and collected the gooey Maldoris mess. Peggy and Joyce rushed out of the room in search of a container. They soon came back with a large five-gallon white metal can for Sister Ruth. Karen kept spitting up more and more of this terrible smelling substance. She'd unload huge gobs every time she retched. An almost continuous flood suited for her from 11 minutes. It was thick and sticky. Much the same as mucus, but from a bad chest and head cold, finally it stopped. The five-gallon can was three-fourths full. Mervyn was gone. This time, it was different from Father Tyson approached Karen with the crucifix. She jumped up and roughly shoved Rogers aside. She kicked Sister Ruth in the face and glared at the priest. Her eyes bulged out of their sockets. The whites were enlarged. It looked as if someone had glued two golf balls where the eyes should have been. She was grotesque and brimming with undiluted hatred for the Catholic priest. Karen's gaze caught the eyes of six-foot-two-inch Tyson. A loud thump resounded throughout the room. Karen had not raised a hand, yet Father Tyson was knocked down to the ground. He began to moan and roll on the carpet. Both hands clasped his abdomen. It was as if someone had drawn back a huge, bald fist and punched the priest in the stomach. The crucifix flew from his hands and now lay down on the floor approximately ten feet where he had standing. Karen's widened eyes fell on the crucifix. We could actually see sparks emit from those hideous looking eyes. Electrical energy appeared to be flowing out of her. The crucifix moved. It bounced along the floor for a moment. It then began to bend and twist as if made of soft rubber. The figure of Christ broke free. The hands no longer nailed to the cross, tightly clasped the figure's head. It looked as if Christ was in more agony at this point than while he was crucified on the cross. Both the cross and the figure of Jesus suddenly disintegrated. We all fearfully stared in amazement. All during this horrifying episode, Rogers, Sister Ruth, and Sutter kept right on praying together. They had closely followed Karen's ever movement and tried to keep their hands on her. She ignored them all as if they didn't exist. Karen again twisted her face into that terrible, diabolical grin. The demon in her seemed to please. She turned and brusquely shoved the three praying partners really out of her way. She walked back to her chair. Her arms were now folded across her chest as she sat down. Karen looked down at her feet. She closed her eyes. Not a sound could be heard in the room other than the gasping of Father Tyson. Tyson was injured, but was still trying to catch his breath. A moment of tension passed. Rogers and the others were still loudly praying. They were commanding King of the House to depart from Karen's body. Their hands were once again laid on Karen. Time seemed to stand still. Then all of a sudden, Karen's eyelids flickered open. Her eyes were back to normal. The terrible swelling had disappeared. A beautiful smile came to her lips as she glanced up at Rogers, Sister Ruth, and Sutter. King of the House slipped away unnoticed. It was now 12.26 p.m. Wow, some crazy stuff there, right? So it looks like we got most of the demons out, but we had um, what appears to be the root demon. <laughs> king of the king of the house. I want to say king of the hill. <laughs> like the cartoon, right? Hey, what's going on there? I'm king of the house. Um, yeah, king of the house slipped away. So this is maybe no bueno because I'm curious about how this, this panned out in the total exorcism. Anyhow, good stuff there. And we'll, we'll take it from here. Let's do some commenting now on what's going on with this. Now a word from our sponsor, M16 Ministries Training Series. Yes, this is the series that keeps the lights on the M16 bunker. Hey, if you're a spiritual warrior and you're any but serious in your prayer warfare and you're dealing with um, supernatural, you're dealing with hauntings, you're dealing with blessing houses, tainting objects, you're dealing with you know full-scale demonic oppression, the occult, 
you have to get your hands on these books. These are the only books out there like this that I know of that train people to walk in their authority. Again, spiritual authority is caught and not taught. You're not going to learn through these little conferences and these things that, that you have you read these formulated. Basically, what they are is like church for doing their rituals. They're, they're rituals. They're rites. They, uh, you do this, this, and this. They're formulas. A formula is a rite. It's a ritual. When you're dealing with the supernatural, there is no methodology. You have to know where you walk in your spiritual authority, hands down. That's it in the battle. So if you want to learn to walk in your spiritual authority and, and get trained up in it, a field guide to spiritual warfare, um, M16 Ministries a field guide training series are what you guys got to get your hands on. The first book I wrote 10 years ago, A Field Guide to Spiritual Warfare, The Power to Pull the Impossible from the Heavenly Realm, uh, written in 2010, and I work with people who deal with hauntings or they have some occult stuff going on. Um, this is the go-to book. I send it out to them and tell them, look, you know, go through this. And they're always excited, like, wow, where was this material? It wasn't in church. That's right, it wasn't, because this was pulled from the trenches. It's all biblical. Because when you see the biblical side and what scriptures and stuff you have to use against this stuff, and you have training know-how, your authority light bulb goes on. I call it the aha moment. Aha! I have authority. You need to learn this. Pastors, you're dealing with um, high-level stuff, the occult, demonic possession, or you're dealing with satanic ritual abuse in your church. You've come across it. What, what gives? You need to get a field guide to advanced spiritual warfare, deliverance, exorcism, and healing the, the effects of ritual abuse. And these books are available on a field guide to spiritual warfare.blogspot.com. Just follow the button links on the side panels there. And yeah, please, I encourage you. We, we spent the time to write these books, get the information out. These are the books I actually wrote for myself. If I had to go back in time, go, hey, when I was dealing with this stuff, is there any good information out here besides all this cookie cut sermon stuff that was just popular and, and just flooding, flooding deliverance books? Look, look, they're all one written, one after the other. Look, all look the same. They're cookie cut. This is not a cookie cut book. This one's different. Why? Because it's written by somebody who was in the trenches of warfare. So get your hands on these books. Thank you. And now back to our regular scheduled programming. So we've gone through nearly all of the exorcism of Karen Kingston that was provided in the book by Robert Pelton. Uh, in the follow-ups he has um, regarding the epilogue on Karen. By July 1976, Karen Kingston had surpassed all of Dr. Manley Fromm's expectations. Her IQ had risen another seven points to a new high of 117. By the late fall of 1976, Karen began doing combined 10th, 11th, and 12th grade level high school work while still under the special tutoring. In the spring of 1977, the third anniversary of her exorcism, both doctors felt that Karen, now age 16, had sufficiently matured and could be safely placed in the public school system. Karen's IQ again was found to have risen, this time by four more points to 121, five points higher than the 116 previously predicted by Dr. Manley Fromm and Dr. Clarence T. Emery. Karen Kington's miracle is complete. She finished her senior year of high school and graduated top honors in June of 1977. In the fall of 1977, when Karen entered college, she majored in mathematics and minored in religion. Cool, some cool stuff there. So she received a full healing. That, that's awesome. So let's go back and let's, let's piece together. Like I said, we we're talking about this was a crime scene investigation here for the Field Guide Spiritual Warfare Crime Scene Investigation Unit. Let's go back and look at a few things here. Um, like I said, a lot of things didn't resonate properly. I'm not poo-pooing this exorcism. I believe the exorcism took place, but I think there was some, some you know, sensationalism going on in the story. I don't know. But let's go back and review a few things that are, are important that lean towards um, how the exorcism did take place, okay? And first of all, I want to go back and look at Reverend Rogers. He was the one that led a lot of the charge into dealing with the demonic possession, right? He was the one going after the demons, he was provoking them. Again, we said that style wasn't good, but at the time, you know, he, he had to do what he had to do. What I'm leaning on here is look at how all the other pastors around him were attacked. And he was the one provoking but he didn't really get attacked, right? What's going on here? That man, Reverend Rogers, was walking in his authority. Oh my gosh, they didn't want to deal with him. They backtalked him, but they didn't try to harm him. Look, they went after Father Tyson. They went after our portly uh, Reverend Sutter, Pastor Sutter there. Did I get an amen? Our Reverend Baptist. He went after um, Sister Ruth too. So the, the demonic, you know, entities knocked Sister Ruth down a couple times, but. Um, they never really went after Reverend Rogers. I think it, 
it's it's an atonement or a, it's something that's saying where he's walking spiritually. He knew where he's walking in his faith with Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ is real. It's, it's not some you know fictitious thing or I'm walking through these rituals and I'm reading these prayers because that's in the Bible it drives out. No, this man knows Jesus is real. It's, uh, you know, he knows Jesus is Lord of Lord, King of Kings and his spirit and his soul. He's a, this is a saved man going up against evil, the forces of darkness. Um, we take a look at things like, I know just 100% man, just, just from this part of the story alone, how he was left alone, that this man is walking it, man. He, Reverend Rogers is doing it. So when we speak of authority, let's look back at Luke 10, 17 through 20, the return of the 70 disciples. The seven returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like lightning in a flash. Look, I have given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, don't rejoice that spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So we know for sure Reverend Rogers is written in heaven. Most likely their pastors are too. But like I said, there was, there was something different here. This, this was not... Reverend Rogers' first rodeo, he know how to took on demonic spirits, and so it's just it's that alone um, helps build up the story of how an observer told it. Because if a lot of this was manufactured, kind of like Hollywood, right? When we see the Hollywood movies, we have the priest stand up against the forces of darkness, and his he just fails in his faith and he falls to the ground, you know, things like that. If we just left the story where we like we had uh, Father Tyson and his cross fall to the ground, and then Jesus flings off it and just you know <laughs> disintegrates we know objects can be manipulated and move like that i i know um individual i worked with on, on other radio shows where in their haunting it was a demonic um, activity in the house that they literally moved a, a a toy dinosaur and animated it so yeah this stuff does happen but what if, if this story was fabricated i think we would have leaned more on having reverend rogers get beat up too and we never saw that we just saw that this was Reverend Rogers knew that the power he was tapping into was far more powerful, infinitely powerful than what Satan can conjure. And he stood in authority against it. So I think that, that alone was, you know, that me on the story that, yeah, this did take place. So it's just, it's, it's incredible. Um, the healing too, the healing that, that Karen received through all this. The other point I want to lay on too, that I thought was kind of fascinating here was, um, there's such a purity to the story, right? It's untainted by what we think we know about deliverance now and exorcism because we have all these books. And there's so much um, just, I don't know, trash out there, folklore, do's and don't do's. Reverend Rogers and his team just went after it like they did the Book of Acts. You got something going on, somebody needs a healing, you lay hands on them. When I speak about in um, some of my training sessions about where I lay hands on people, there's this false notion around church where we're going, you can't lay hands on demon-possessed people because the demons will go into you. You know, I get this all the time. Then, within an hour later, those same people, if I talk about Christians can be demonized, well, they can't be demonized because they got the Holy Spirit in them. <laughs> you see the conflict in this, this, this notion that, oh my gosh, I can't lay hands on people, I'll get demonized. But I can't have a demon, I have the Holy Spirit in me. So, yeah, there's just this weird thing, but the purity of how, you know, Reverend Rogers just went after, like, the book of Acts. He knew his Bible. He knew his scriptures. This man was awesome. So he just laid hands on people, and this is what you do. I mean, you don't, you could just lay hands on somebody that's demonized, not say a word, and just have them whole, say, Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, fill this person. The demons aren't going to stick around. They don't like it. You can just sit there quietly. You don't have to know what to say. You don't have to have all your little deliverance conference books. Lay hands on the person. You and another person never do this alone. Always have somebody else with you. You know, safety in numbers. And um, keep an eye on the person as you're laying hands on them. You know, in case they manifest, something happens. When something pops up, just keep laying hands. Holy Spirit, more. I bind whatever's looking at me right now. I bind you in the authority of Jesus Christ. You're done. And you know, just lay hands on somebody. Just, just pray for the Holy Spirit to come. They'll drive them out too. Um, that's if you're just stuck. You don't know what to do. You don't have to have all the words. Let the Holy Spirit do it. He, Jesus and the Holy Spirit and God, they're the ones that drive this stuff out, not us. We have authority, yes, because God gave it to us at the cross. So walk in your authority, like Reverend Rogers showed us. Like like he said, like, you know, my master is Jesus Christ, right? And then the, the spirits always retort, like, well, what makes you think you're, you, know, you can answer to him or he's going to help you? That's their typical thing. They're going to plea bargain or they're going to argue with you. But yeah, no, Jesus is my master. He's my Lord and Savior. And you guys are done. 
So his attitude of how he came through all this was kind of cool. It was very, you know, golf clap. Golf clap to Reverend Rogers there. Golf clap. So, you know, this stuff's amazing. Uh, the other thing I want to talk on, too, is um, this, the handwriting was not indicative of demonic possession. I'm leaning towards you. Know, what we're seeing here was an exorcism with demonic possession. You know, the levitation and stuff like that. But, you know, sometimes the stories of levitation, too, in this book are what kind of threw me on the side of the fence. This stuff was sensationalized. I've seen levitation. I've seen it happen, but not for seven or ten minutes. You know, people go on the ceiling banging their heads on the wall and stuff. And it just, something was wrong as to why a man of this, this stature and spiritual walk, Reverend Rogers, didn't bind it right away. You see somebody starting to float, I bind you to the ground, you know? He would have done that. That's I, I feel that's what he would have done, or probably even have done in these sessions. I don't know. But again, so going back to using um, the writing, one, it's spirit writing. If these were demons writing, this is, you know, uh, this is a, a faux pas. No, no. Don't let the demons write. Don't let them write anything. Remember I explained to you last time how um, the demons were writing um, witchcraft spells for people to read out loud? <laughs> You know, the curse them. Don't give them the opportunity to speak. Shut them down. Second is, it's not indicative of a demonic possession. Uh, the people I work with who are survivors of the occult, they have multiple identities. And all these identities can come up. They can use different hands, you know, whatever. And none of their handwriting looks the same. It's like different identities have different styles of writing. So from that point of view, this this whole thing, you know, it wasn't a... It didn't sell me on the part of demonic possession. It was just the story itself that, that sold me that this exorcism was real. So like I said, yeah, it's just maybe we had more information now and maybe probably Reverend Rogers would have chose something else rather than have her write stuff down like he did. I'm just curious what he thinks about that now or if they're even still alive. I'd be curious because none of the people at the end of the book are mentioned how to contact them. They could have passed away as their families. Um, how do we get a hold of them? And supposedly they recorded this stuff there may have been video there may have been audio that would um kind of help the story too but it's not there it's just um we do know that the information went out to different conferences towards the end of um the 70s they talked about a lot of the handwriting and stuff so that got out somehow so this this exorcism did take place and the, we know that karen was liberated i'm just curious to what extent she was liberated also I know 100%, like I said, after what she went through as a child, she has to have dissociation. It, did she receive healing and dissociation and other things? You know, as she's older, maybe it'd be kind of cool for her to come out and speak to churches and stuff and talk about it. You know, I don't know. But that's kind of my feel on it. It's just there's there's no way she couldn't have walked away without being dissociated with her child experiences. Um, this is even before demonic possession. I made comments, too, that if she was this heavily demonized, somebody did stuff to her in satanic rituals. Maybe that's why she's hiding. Maybe she's not talking about it. I don't know. So horrible stuff was done to get her to this level of possession. These just weren't generational spirits, right? Something, they, they put her through something. And they had the, the spirits of pedophilia come up. Those were from rituals. Something was going on here. So it's just, yeah, there's a whole story here. And I, I imagine now she probably wants her privacy. She's got to be like 60 years old now or 70, who knows, with this stuff. So yeah, she probably wants her privacy or whatever's going on. But it It'd be interesting to have a little more detail or documentation or even just, you know, release the audio tapes that are somewhere. It's, I don't think we'd ever get anything out of them just hearing the, the growling and shouting and stuff going on. Like I said, there was a lot of banter going on. We didn't need that either. So when this banter happens, you know, they're talking about, I'm, I'm in charge. Why do you want to know who's charge? You know, bind them to shut up. And just lay hands there and command it to go. The authority of Jesus Christ command you to go. You're sitting there for 15 or 20 minutes, things just stare at you, just Holy Spirit more. Holy Spirit, increase in this room. Fill this room so we can't even stand, right? Just Holy Spirit, increase your presence. And they're there for 20 minutes staring back at you. In the authority of Jesus Christ, what sin are you? I, I command you to answer truthfully in the name of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit, you know, make them answer in Jesus' name. And then wait for the sin to come up and bind it to the sin. Command to leave. Most Christians are under the assumption because of Acts 16, the way Paul kicked out that pathonic demon. It said it came out in the King James Version in that hour, which leads, leads me to believe it took an hour for that thing to come out, right? It, a lot of Bibles say it. Right away it came out. I don't believe it did, but it's possible. Paul was really su super naturally walking in his authority. So maybe it did come out, but I kind of think it kind of showed um, who Paul was as a man and his faith. It took him an hour to cast out a, a, a person who was demonically possessed that subjugated themselves to demonic possession, which is a harder one to kick out. He did it in one hour. As compared to Jesus, it comes out right away, right? So 
yeah, Christians, keep in mind, it could take several days like this did. Just, or it could take, you know, I've worked on cases where, depending on something like this, it could take up to a year or so. If it only took three days and as demonically possessed as Karen Kingston was, then it was totally under the Holy Spirit to liberate her within those three days. And again, we don't know where King of the House was. It cracks me up with the name. I'm King of the House. Sounds like King of the Hill, right? Um, he got away. Where'd he go? Is he still around? Did he still affect Karen nowadays? We don't know. So it's just, you know, just there's some answered questions here, but, you know, it is what it is. I know a lot of churches have turned this into a Bible study. It's not worth the Bible study. It is not. Um, it's an interesting story. It's an interesting read. It's in large print. Um, I didn't find it all that interesting to be read through as a Bible study. It's just because there's so much banter here, so much going on. It's actually a lot of it the wrong way or how not to conduct an exorcism. Again, it was effective because it was on the grace of Jesus Christ, right? You know, Pelton probably did a lot of deliverance ministries of oppression and all of a sudden, bam, there was this demonic possession. So, you know, the Holy Spirit walked him up on his training up to this point. You get my point here? So we didn't see Reverend Rogers flinch any time when weird stuff was happening. He always stepped back in. He let the other pastors, you know, he was operating one accord, book of Acts, right? He was operating on one accord with the other pastors, but when something got out of their control, like Father Tyson, who never did this before, we saw Father Rogers, excuse me, we saw Reverend Rogers step up to the plate and handle things. So it's just, you know, it is what it is. It's an interesting book, but, you know, I know as churches doing this as Bible studies, it's, it's not worth the Bible study. Um, you may find it fascinating because you've never seen this demonic stuff before, but like I said, I've been through so many of these, this one kind of raised more questions than it did answers, and it's definitely not worth being training material, if that's if that's where I can leave this at. Anyhow, so I hope you enjoyed our uh, very first three broadcasts of Tales of Glory from the files of M16 Ministries. Again, um, we thank you for listening in, and if you ever want to support our ministry, we can always use the help. You can go to a field guide to spiritualwarfare.blogspot.com. There's a PayPal button. Just, just tag that thing and show us some love, man. We can always use it. Anyhow, this ends the first uh, three episodes. We're covering the Devil and Karen Kingston book by Robert W. Pelton. All right, warriors, be safe out there. Uh, remember to do your daily prayers. And God bless. Tales of Glory is copyright 2019 by Michael, Michael J. Norton. 